Welcome back to the Community Strategy Podcast. I'm Deb Shell, your host here, and I've interviewed over 100 community leaders, business owners, and facilitators who give you the backstage pass to their community strategy. I'm a creator turned community builder, and after failing my launch in 2020, I discovered I had a passion for community events, cultivating belonging, and developing a strategy for success. As the author of Creator to Community Builder, Find Calm While Building Your Online Community, I encourage you to dig deep and go beyond the surface level marketing and understand your ideal member. As a community and marketing strategist, I've helped over 70 business owners in developing and implementing a launch plan for an online community course or membership. On this podcast, I share interviews with community builders just like you who have a message, a purpose, and who want to bring a group of humans together for a purpose. You are invited to join Community Builders with Purpose to connect with like-minded people who want to learn how to run, manage, and grow a online community. The community is free, so I hope you can join. Uh, it's a new place to share your community concept, ask questions about community building, and connect with us for an intentional community development strategy. Our members join programs and special events to continue learning and growing. The community is an ecosystem, a place where you can join no matter what stage you're in, beginner, intermediate, or advanced. I hope to see you inside. Now let's get started. Jumping in uh, to season three, and I'm excited to share with you this episode. It is a recording of a live stream that we did during International Women's Day, and a few panelists are there, uh, and I do have the information for the, of the panelists uh, in the show notes, so definitely check that out in the links that they provided for us for additional resources around support supporting women. We wanted to celebrate International Day, and I wanted to do something really special to launch the podcast, and so this ended up being like the perfect solution. So today what you're going to hear is either one or part one or part two uh, of the recording because it is an hour. And so my goal is to create podcast episodes between 20 and 30 minutes uh, for season three. So what we're going to do is you're going to hear half of the conversation. You're going to have to wait. <laughs> you're going to have to be patient until next week. And uh, next week you'll get to hear part two. If you just heard part two, please go back and watch part one because these women are amazing, inspiring, and, and just celebrating International Women's Day, something I wanted to do for a really long time. And I'm so thankful that I was able to bring these women together for this conversation. Uh, coming up this season, you are going to hear some amazing live interviews, or sorry, recordings of live interviews through the Community Builders with Purpose. Now, if you're not familiar, this is a brand new community that I just launched in 2024. So it hasn't been around that long. Uh, right after I wrote my book and published it, Community Builders with Purpose is had just launched in January after the launch of my book, Creator to Community Builder, Find Calm While Building Your Online Community. It's available on Amazon, uh, but uh, I won't go any further. I'll let you uh, jump into this episode, but I hope you enjoy it. Please leave us a rating, a review. Let us know what you think about these kind of episodes. And I can't wait to share with you more episodes and recordings from Community Builders with Purpose. So, uh, and you can join me and talk with me and these other women. Enjoy the episode. One of the most amazing things that I've really appreciated in the younger generations, people younger than me, is that they seem to be much more accepting of where they are in this moment and not having to just go up the ladder or achieve this or achieve that or look a certain way. Um, this acceptance of loving yourself, no matter what that means, is an amazing um thing because that's not something I learned. I, I mean, I definitely learned that you there's a way to look and there's a way not to look as a woman. And there's a, you know, there's sizes that are good and there's sizes that are bad of clothing, you know? And I think one of the things that I um I'm learning much more about is just this this whole fat bias and people who have struggles. And I'm a plus size person at the, in this body currently. And I think that's something that I have found so much struggle with people, um, women that are women, obviously we've, we've, there's reports that women make less 
than men in, in situations, but also even the women that are um, that are fat that they, you know, would recognize as fat, you know, they make even less than the women that are thin. And so I think that there's also these other little adjustments that we need to really think about is I think it's just going to make it all better if we can just say, it's okay, you look great. We don't need to be, have you look any different than what you look like today. And so I wanted to transition us to talking a little bit more about acceptance and in our bodies, acceptance of our minds, acceptance that we're smart. Um, so I wanted to see what the thoughts were about that. I mean, that is such a good uh, topic to bring up, Debbie, because I do feel like um, women hold a lot of baggage around this and it holds them back, especially in an era where so much of your professional success is tied to your brand image. Uh, I think that that's, um, that's a circle of life that's come back around where, you know, the face that you put out to the world is judged and accepted, but it's also, you can't get away from not doing it. You have to participate. You have to, um, you have that photo on your LinkedIn that every single recruiter is going to check before they hire you. That's a real thing. Um, and I think that this is a, there's a couple of things I'll say here, you know, otherness, is something kind of hard baked into humans. We're tribal creatures, right? There's a big part of our amygdala that is dedicated to, you're not like me, you're not in my tribe. You know, that's a that's a human, human thing. And I, and I think to get to our Star Trek future where we are equal and judged for who we are as a person, um, we are going to have to um, educate ourselves out of it. And I do have high hopes for the younger generation. I, I think they've done a really good job of this. Um, so I think that there's that otherness that we have to get over. But then at the same time, I think we also have to get over our own hangups around this, however they've been baked into us. Um, I loved, I read an article not that long ago where it was like the woman was getting older and she said she got to the mirror and she would look in the mirror and she'd be, who is that old lady looking at me? And then she just put on some lipstick and go about her day. Like, what am I going to do? You know? So I think that is a little bit of that, that each of us have to kind of get over. Obviously, there's a human thing there and a cultural thing there. But I did want to give you this quote, too. It's from Erica McKean, who's a blogger. You don't owe it to your mother. You don't owe it to your children. You don't owe it to civilization in general. Prettiness is not a rent you pay for occupying a space marked female. That's so powerful, really. Teresa. Sorry, I, I'll pass on to the next person. Um, I, I just jumped in there. I'm, I'm being British and remaining in the queue. I was thinking about that, and it sort of inspired me to consider, like, how does all of this stuff impact our relationship with ourselves and how much this impacts, like, your own, like, like experience and relationship with yourself and even like information about yourself that's uh, obscured like one of the things i've been doing as a therapist i've i've recently you know come, referred people for a diagnosis for neurodiversity for example and you know females don't get diagnosed until they're in their 20s and 30s that means we go through a whole childhood and i'm myself i'm a neurodiverse woman and um so perception of even myself and my reality and my experiencing is curated by what society notices about me. And that I don't even know things. I'm not even allowed to know things about myself that society doesn't take the time to say, we need to figure out how to diagnose autism in women too. It doesn't present the same as it does in men. And there needs to be like a, like research done about this so that women are not walking through their lives up until their thirties with behaviors and needs and feelings and experiences that they don't even realize is a part of like their, their brain wiring. And then the negative feedback that women get about themselves. I'm a very direct communicator. I can't tell you how many other women, other men, who have oriented to me like I'm being offensive because of how my brain is. And it's like, why do we live in a world where I don't know this about myself, that this is an unchangeable, immutable fact about me because of the way the world is. And I can't like be, I can't be who I am designed to be in the space. I think there's a lot of truth in what you're saying, Melissa, around those 
the stereotypes or the assumptions that people can make about what it means to be a woman and this idea of directness and courage being something that um, might be trickier for some people to get their heads around. Um, I'm not sure they necessarily the idea of them being aligned to specific genders is just you're going to find people who are bold and dynamic and in all sorts of different identities. The idea that we should, that it's the word lady, isn't it? That's one of my bugbears, the, 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 the encoding of, because lady, the traditional definition of the word lady is you didn't have legal rights yourself. So you were sort of like attached to a man. So that's what that kind of, that's where that kind of moniker comes from. And the idea of the, it encodes demureness and silence and compliance and, all of these things into an identity and the A idea comment, that you're the comment where women are behind men. <laughs> I hate that comment. Yes. I was watching TV yes. with my nephew earlier this morning and they had the, there's always a woman mm. behind us. I'm like, no, <laughs> let's stop saying that. We don't need to Maybe be behind anybody. To <laughs> yeah. Can we not stand next to each other? I know it's not, you know, I know if we're cheering, yeah, it might yes. be problematic, but, but yeah, but no, it's very true though, isn't it? It's this idea of, you know, how do we, you know, what does it mean to be a good woman? And, you know, how do we kind of like what, what gets coded onto us or what gets sort of loaded onto us and the idea of being a pretty little girl and all these other ideas. And there's nothing wrong with prettiness and there's nothing wrong with femininity, but the idea that it's a gilded cage. Um, and, and I think that's for me where I've found it quite problematic. And I'm nearing, I suppose, middle age, 42, is that middle age? I don't know. In the middle of life. Um <laughs> You know, life begins again, um, whatever whatever you choose to call it. But the idea that people still see me as young, and that's fine. I suppose I'm young. We're all younger than Methuselah. But the the idea that, um, you know, you, you're not seen for your maturity or you're not seen for your experience because of that word getting coded onto you. And the same with if you have a, you know, whatever, everyone's attractive to someone and we all have different perceptions of beauty. But the idea that you see someone as beautiful and they're, therefore you don't take them seriously or you decide that they have to behave in a certain way. I think that's the problem with those stereotypes, isn't it? It's, it's why we're giving people one label and we're taking other labels away from them. So I think for me, you know, the idea of navigating those pros and cons of image and identity, um, I don't know how many of you, your avatars on social media aren't your face or, or your avatars on social media might not show a lot of information or your profiles might not show a lot of information about you because you're a woman. I've had to lock my profiles down quite a lot because of the nature of my work being an online community professional, you know, being on the receiving end of doxing um, uh, or like stalking or threats or, you know, people making complaints about you, um, trying to hit you up on LinkedIn. Um, that's super creepy. But it's, it's all those sorts of things where you show up as a woman and people treat you differently and in ways where any normal person would presume that would be disrespectful behaviour. So I think for me, those are the things. It's navigating those pros and cons. So a friend of mine, um, she was leading an event and she did an incredible job. And this guy followed her uh, on LinkedIn. He said, I'd love to connect with you and talk with you. And he wanted to ask her out on a date, despite the fact that she'd spent this time at the event chatting socially about, you know, she'd gone away with her partner and she'd done all these other things. And so his intro to her was, I'm going to ask you on a date, despite the fact you've led this professional event and you've talked about your relationship. So it's these sort of assumptions and these sorts of behaviours, I think, are just deeply problematic. So I just thought that would be helpful as a as my perspective to add to this conversation. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to, I mean, all of that is, I mean, it's, it's, it's all so true. And, and so many of us can relate to that, Serena and Melissa. Um, I just wanted to chime in with, of course, um, how important it is for, for all of us as women to show up and, and be mentors, to be coaches, to be an example, a representation of what different types of women look like, how some women are bold and some women are assertive and some women are, you know, all of these things. Um, you know, we can't control what we see in the media, but we can, we are the media nowadays, like Melissa said, we're the web. So the more we show up and the more we are bold enough to be ourselves and say what we have to say and more than just feel that things are wrong in society, but speaking up about it, doing something about it, not just talking about it. Uh, the more that we do that, we'll see more and more positive representation of different types of women, um, you know, in, in the media and online in general and in our day-to-day -day interactions. So, um, you know, very, very um, heavy hitting 
points I myself have experienced a number of um, the things that you mentioned, Serena, and we can go for, we can have a whole day's conversation there of, of the way that um, we, you know, how we're treated when we show up in the world. Uh, but it's so important for us to continue to do the work we're doing as women and continue to celebrate, not just today, but every day is Women's Day, if that makes sense. It does, CJ. And I think that was really well said. For me, the action to inspire change and something that's really worked for me is to show up as authentically myself and then keep showing up. And I recognize some people don't have the privilege or the space to be able to do that, but do what you can when you can. And when I'm authentically myself, instead of putting myself in this little box that society wants, instead of, you know, acting or leading like a man would or showing up like I'm expected to, it not only helps pave the way for others, but it helps me feel better. It helps me save my energy. It's so much easier to be me than to be this idea of what society wants me to be. And so I hope it makes it easier for other women to be themselves as well. But I I think that's the work that I try and do every day when I show up. And listen, I think you're right. One of the things I took from what's been said here is is how exhausting it is, right? And and, and I I really have, I really do believe um, that carrying that extra weight is takes a bigger toll on our careers and our personal lives than we give it credit for. And so one of the things I would tell you, uh, advice I got a long time ago was you can't carpet the whole world. Has anybody heard that before? Um, yeah, so the reality is, is that it was, it was around child rearing and you worry so much about your kids and you wanna send them out in the world and you wanna make the world bully proof and you wanna make people slow down at kid intersections and you wanna you know, you know, do all these things to carpet the world for your children, right? Cause you want them to be safe. <clears throat> nothing more important to that to you than that. And I would say that too for women though, we cannot carpet the whole world at this point. I think we should keep our eye on that Star Trek future where we are going to carpet the whole world and everyone's eventually going to be equal. But I think if you're talking about combating this today, I think as women, what we can do for each other is um, make space for each other. I think that, you know, if they're not going to make space for us and they're not going to welcome us, then we will make our own spaces. We will make our own safety. And then I think we need to be really conscious of provi- about providing uh, parachutes for women who need to get out of toxic scenarios. So if you have an open role in your sphere, I can promise you um, there is a woman in a, in a, in a, in a tough um, unwelcoming environment that would be happy to have that role in your good and happy environment. So I think that it, that's, that's something all of us can do today. It does not carpet the world. It does not solve the problem uh, in the long term. I think we're all going to have to work on that for years and years to come. But if we want to today positively impact someone else, uh, be a parachute, be an exit ramp, be a voice and be an, be a safe space. I would say be a welcoming space. I want to shout out for Maria because she has created some really amazing safe spaces in central Pennsylvania. And last, was it last year you did hair story reclaiming our crown? What an yes. amazing performance and a story. So I was hoping maybe you'd share a little bit about that for the ladies who might not be familiar with it. Sure. Um, um, uh- I was thinking about that as I'm hearing the ladies uh, speak because uh, definitely the theme of Hair Story Reclaiming Our Crown is um, radical self-love, like to be bold enough to say that it is that it is okay to be me and this is how I show up and that there's nothing wrong with how I show up. I was made that way. Um, uh, one theme of the show is it's about uh, hair bias, which a lot of people outside of the African American community and Afro Latina community aren't aware of. But um, we are often um, pressured uh, to uh, put chemicals in our hair that would make it be the texture uh, of white people's hair. And and when we do that, we are then 
told that we can enter these spaces. You are now a professional. You are now uh, worth listening to. You are now uh, maybe worthy of an interview or something like that. And if we show up the way with our hair, the way it grows out of our heads, we may be barred and excluded from those spaces. And that has happened um, with uh, friends of mine I know being fired because they changed their hairstyle. Friends of mine, um, their their kids being barred from sports or getting in trouble at school because of their hairstyle. Um, that is natural and the and maybe even ancient ancient uh, hairstyles that we've had for hundreds of years in the African um, diaspora because this is how it grows out of our head. And those chemicals that we're pressured to use are then, um, we have recently found, studies have found, they cause cancer. They, they are killing us. So it's a, so it's more like, um, well, you can be in this space, but you must take your life into your hands. So, um, through my work with Hair Story, which is a choreo poem, a play written in poetic form, um, we the the themes in the poetry like encourage people to just be yourself. That that is okay, and even if you choose to um, to wear a weave, a wig, a, a, a to perm your hair, just do it with the knowledge of what you are doing, why you are doing, and show up authentically you wherever you enter. Thank that you so much. That is absolutely amazing, Maria. Sorry, Dev. I just wanted to say that really quickly. I, I really enjoyed that, and I'd love to connect with you to learn more about that production. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am excited to say that uh, for Juneteenth, we will be performing a portion of the show in the Capitol Rotunda in Harrisburg. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. Will it be recorded? Um, still working on all the details, so we shall oh. see. <laughs> okay, good answer. No worries, but congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what else we got? So as we gather as women, like we're gathering today, um, I think we talked a little bit about how we can be more accepting with each other, but what about our needs and what, what, um, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs says that we need to have these certain things to feel safe and secure. And not all women today have those things, many, many struggle uh, to get there and they don't have the ability to have their own agency yet. How can we help those women or what have um, have we done or how can we um, maybe reach across and try to um, make it make it safer for other women? Uh, I can I can start and then I'll um, put myself on mute. But um, I am a part, as you mentioned, of a, a wonderful organization in um, out of Kenya called Women in AI Africa, WEA. And um, the, we just announced today, as a matter of fact, a, a brand new um, piece of AI-driven technology that will help women uh, in Kenya and around uh, across Africa and potentially around the world um, that are ex going through the process of motherhood. Um, and so it's really, really um, a profound and exciting project. Uh, so one thing is, of course, getting involved with things that are helping women in the world. That's my point. Um, you know, sometimes it can be something really, really small in terms of uh, maybe giving a piece of your time or it might be writing a, a letter on their behalf or doing something small or it could be something um, at, a, at a larger magnitude, you know. Um, actually teaching a capacity building class or something of that sort. So I just wanted to invite uh, everyone on the panel as well as yourself, Deb, and all of the listeners um, and viewers, uh, if you are interested in doing something that's going to change the world and is aligned with um, one of the sustainable development um, goals uh, through the UN, um, this is a big opportunity and a great way for you to support women uh, in that region and by extension, women around the world. 
That's so amazing, that's a big CJ. one. Of course, there are smaller ones. <laughs> <laughs> that's so great, though, to hear about the work that you're doing. So I'd love to connect offline and, and learn more about how to get involved. In thinking about all of this stuff and my work with trauma, particularly, I think one of the things is that we have to realize the ubiquity of trauma and destigmatize addressing our own trauma, um, recognizing that we have a world that just pours trauma into the experience of every woman that occupies space here. I, every day, you know, vast majority of my clients are women. Um, I think about the modality that I practice, which is called dialectical behavioral therapy, was created by a woman by the name of Marsha Linehan. And she recently published a book in which she discussed her own diagnosis of borderline personality disorder that she that prompted her to create this modality of therapy and how she went her entire career and didn't feel that she could disclose her diagnosis. And her diagnosis was an integral piece of why she created the modality in the first place. And the way in which she was, she, her modality has been able to, you know, set so many women, so many people free of um, things that had plagued their, their mental well being over the course of their lives. And I think about her individual story and how she was then able to translate that story into something that did, has done so much profound good in individual lives and our collective society. And then here is this woman feeling like she has to be silent about her own struggle. And like, it was such a blessing to have her transparent autobiography put out there and like recognize that her struggle is part of why she has been able to create something in the world. And like, we have to feel, we have to create more safety for us to talk about the things that we, we feel ashamed or afraid to speak of. We have to, we have to um, depopulate the unspeakable. That's sort of my take on it. We we only have a few minutes. It's, it went so fast. <laughs> and we only have a few minutes. I want to comment real quick about this too, because I had, um, I've struggled with mental illness my entire life. And I did not, unfortunately, get the care that I needed when I was younger, when I was suicidal. And somehow I ended up coping and somehow I thankfully I'm here today. Um, but I think overall women d just, they need help. <laughs> so we need help, you know, especially with people who are struggling with mental illness because it's so looked at, you know, I've been called crazy more times than I can count. I've been, you know, treated differently because of my differences. And I think that going back to a little bit of what we were talking about earlier too, it's like, there's just so much work to do, but we have come really so far that I feel so thankful to be living in this time period when we do have the ability to speak out like this freely. There are people in this world that still are not able to speak freely. And it's, that's absurd to me that that people are shutting down women and, and silencing them still to this day. And I think that's something that we continue to work on. And I think all of you here today are a part of that, of sharing these messages and being brave enough because there are so many consequences that come with speaking your truth. And facing those head on, I think, is such a courageous and inspiring thing to do. And so thank you all for being courageous and sharing here today about yourself and your story and other women and, and just being so supportive because it's just such an amazing feeling to be able to be in a room with all of you. And I'm just so thankful for you. So I'll just, I'll ask if anyone has any final thoughts and then we'll wrap up. Just wanted to say thank you, Deb, for creating this space for us and for your audience and the listeners. And I couldn't imagine a better way to start, International Women's Day here in San Francisco. So I'm really grateful for you and all the work you've done to bring us together. You're here. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, I, Debbie. I, I appreciate I, you, Deb. <laughs> mm. Sorry, Maria. 
<laughs> That's okay. No, I was just going to say, Deb, thank you. Um, again, I love the work that you're doing. And thank you for bringing um, all of us together. And um, it, it really does a lot to open, open doors, these doors of communication and um, new ideas and, and things that we could, um, you never know what can grow out of meetings like this. So, so it's a beautiful thing. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deb. It's a beautiful Thanks. spirit of graciousness mm -hmm. uh, to all of us. And it's such a gift. Thank you so much, Deb. And I think a lot of us were talking about how it's not really about words. It's about action. You know, all the work that we're doing on International Women's Day, you know, we're not, it's not just about words and it's not just one day. It's about action. It's about how we show up for ourselves and for each other. And it's great to be part of something that's so constructive and, and proactive. So, yeah, thank you for facilitating this space for us. And Deb, I just want to say, hearing your story, um, as I started, you know, our stories, our scars, it, it helps to inspire and, and help other people. And so you are seen, Deb, you know, we see you, we appreciate you, uh, we understand, you know, um, and when I say that, you know, everyone has their own experiences. But we, we, we have grace for you and what you're experiencing in life. And we are all here and we're excited that you have created this wonderful space for, for women and for us. So thank you so much, Dale. We appreciate you. I appreciate all of you. I wanted to say real quick, I think it's what, when Melissa was saying earlier about trauma, we, we do, uh, you know, I have personally struggled very much with this most recently and it led to a lot of challenges that I have in my life right now, but I feel like I've been so supported by women that were not my family that I found along the path that became my new family. And that has been such a gift for me to be able to, um, feel accepted, even if it isn't with my own family, but it is, it's with other women that become my family. And so that's mm -hmm. how I've been able to really find peace and, and acceptance through all of these challenges. And, you know, looking back as I'm mid, I'm in my mid life too, I guess I'm 40, I'll be 44, you know, next month. So I'm right there with y'all. Um, and so through all of these things that we see, I'm just trying to work on being prouder of myself. And I think everybody should be proud of who they are and what they're doing to contribute to women and just the, the world in general of making it a better place for the next generation. So I know all of you are amazing and doing lots of fun work. Uh, so I thank you again for being here. Uh, if you are listening to this on the podcast, good news, there is two episodes. So uh, we're going to have uh, episode one will be the first half of this. And then the second episode will be the, the uh, second part. And so I will be sharing those at the launch. This is our event that launches the Community Strategy Podcast Season 3. I'm very excited about that and thankful that you were all able to be a part of that with me today. Um, so with that, we will wrap up for the day. I hope you're finding calm in this day, evening, moment, afternoon, wherever you are. I hope you're finding calm. Until the next time, take care and bye. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the Community Strategy Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you're following or subscribed wherever you listen. This helps me because I know you won't miss an episode and it helps you because you will always get the episodes right away. This podcast has produced by myself, Deb Shell, independent owner of Find Calm Here. If you really enjoyed this episode, I am looking for some Apple podcast reviews. Um, I'm going to explain to you how to do that right now. First, if you go to your Apple podcast and click on the circle with the three dots on the top right corner, then make sure you're following the show. Second, uh, next click go to show and scroll down to where it says ratings and reviews. Then right above about, you will see a little square with a pencil. Next to the square, you'll see write a review. Make sure you save the review before closing out your screen. I would love if you could do that for me. If you don't want to say anything nice, then don't say, don't leave a review. <laughs> uh, I hope that you enjoy this podcast and this season, and I hope you're finding calm in any day, 
even today or tomorrow, any day, moment, even afternoon, today, Saturday at four. Find calm until the next time. Take care. Bye. Mm -hmm.